So hello, my name is Lars Fritzenius. I'm here again to talk about subplot. So uh, in the previous meetup, I talked about subplot. So when we start again, I should talk about subplot. And I will tell you in a moment what subplot is. I have a the manual, if you could pass it around. There's only one copy, so please don't hog that. And if you get the pages in the wrong order, that's fine, they're numbered. So let's say that you are a software consulting company who has gotten a really large customer, say Airbus, who desperately need a, an implementation of the Unix seek command. Seek is a simple command in Unix where you run seek and a number, and it writes out every number of one to that number you give it. And this program is worth Airbus $1 billion. But it has to work. It has to be exactly correct. If it's not correct, planes will fall down. So what do you do? You start writing requirements. Serious numbers of requirements. This is an example. If you run seek without any arguments, it should produce an error. And if you run seek with a, the number zero argument, it should produce no output. But it's not an error. And so on. Um, comparing these two, there is a scenario that verifies that seek works the way it's supposed to, seek, supposed to work. And the scenario consists of steps. When I try to run seek, then the exit code is one. These steps are very simple. They're also very similar from one scenario to another. So when we have more scenarios, it's easy to just adjust the scenario steps quite simply. And there's a lot of these scenarios. I'm going to go through all of them in detail. No, I'm not. Um, also, some more error cases. One thing that the scenarios are meant to show, meant to do, is that they're not understandable only to the customer technical people and our technical people, but more importantly to the CEO of Airbus, who is probably not a programmer, although I didn't check. The scenarios can be typeset, and this is actual output from the subplot tool. And when you have this scenario, somehow these need to result in executable code. And subplot is developed by people like me who are not intelligent enough to do machine learning. So there's no artificial intelligence in, in this project. Instead, we have a way to map a scenario step to a function which might be written in Rust or a different language. In this case, they are in Rust. And um, on line one, we not just say what the step should look like, but we capture a part of the step, the count, which is some digits, also known as an unsigned integer. When we actually get to the uh, implementation of the step function, we get to the interesting part, which is Rust code. That's what we are here for. And um, subplot reads files like this, code like this, and produces something that can actually, actually be executed. And this is the code that subplot reads can be a little bit magical. There are macros and, and attributes derived stuff that mean that the thing that the compiler actually sees and compiles isn't exactly what is here. So the on line three, the step macro means that this function gets transmogrified into something that does a little bit more than is written here. This is so that it's easier to write these step functions. 
the function gets the uh, something called a context as a, an argument, which is the context of running that scenario. And an argument called count, which is an unsigned integer, that is the captured value from the step. And then it does things like it compares the number of lines in the actual output with what, with what was expected, and if that's wrong, then it throws an error. I should point out at this point that I'm not a tester. I have received no formal training in testing. But I've been writing code for 38 years and some weeks now. So I've run into situations where it's fairly important that code works. So subplot is something that I and a different person uh, that I'm coming back to in a moment uh, wrote to make this kind of testing easier. One of the things we've realized also is that it's not enough to just know what is tested and how it's tested, but also why things need to be that way. That is why if we go here, uh, we document not just the actual scenario, the steps, but the actual requirement that we are verifying. This turns out to be unusual. Uh, while talking about testing, it's often important to distinguish between different kinds of testing. And different kinds of testing have different audiences. Unit testing is the audience is developers. The developer who wrote the code, the developer who worked with the person who wrote the code, and future developers who will hate the person who wrote the code. Every project has at least two developers. My projects are mostly me and future me. And future me really doesn't like current me. Um, there's also integration testing, which is combining multiple, multiple units into one, one test. And the thing that subplot is meant for, which is acceptance testing, uh, where we we are not testing that only that things work, but that things do the thing that they should be doing. Not testing does it work, but is it the right thing? Is the Airbus CEO happy about this seek command? Because he's really, really, really interested in it. Acceptance criteria are then the requirements that a system needs to have needs to fulfill so that all the important people for that project are happy with it, that they accept the outcome. And there are all sorts of, of tests, and I'm not going to go through all of those, but we'll go for, forward. And the people who matter to a project are called stakeholders, and which stakeholders matter to each project varies. Sometimes it's only the developer. Sometimes it's end users, sometimes it's other implementers, sometimes it's future implementers. And some things can't be tested easily or can't be tested automatically. Subplot is about automatic testing, but there are uh, things that are really hard to test. The thing I'm working on that I get paid to work for is an encryption tool, Sequoia PGP. One of the um, requirements we have is that it needs to be legal. How do you test if something is legal? Automatically for every commit. And um, there are, there are uh, even today there are cases when the tool I'm working on for and in my, my, in my day job, is not actually legal anymore. So, subplot. In 2012, I and Daniel Silverstone were having lunch during a work day in Manchester, England. We both worked for the same company at the time, and we had this idea that 
there are certain kinds of testing that we feel need to be done that we don't have any good tool for. And we knew about Cucumber and we knew about Gherkin, but these didn't fit the things that we thought we needed. So we discussed this and the following weekend I wrote something that's called Yarn. It was a few hundred lines of Python. It's entirely crap. Don't look it up. I will be ashamed. And But it proved to be useful. And I used Yarn for most of the 2010s until 2019 when we decided that, okay, we have proven that this concept works. Now we need to do it well. And thus was born Fable. Fable turned out to be a bad name because it was already used, so we renamed it into Subplot. And Subplot is um, a tool that we currently work on. It's a hobby project, although maybe someone will pay for us someday, but we don't know. The important part about Subplot is documentation. There are many people who use quite successfully, quite happily, tools like Cucumber to verify that their software works. But Cucumber is not a great tool for documenting why these tests exist. And our approach is that documentation comes first. It's nice if that results in automated testing, but documentation comes first. Subplot, this is the architectural overview. It has many colors, many different shapes of blobs. So subplot uh, reads a markdown file, which is the actual document. And then it reads the YAML file that I showed earlier, which is, we called it bindings, and then uh, one or more Rust or Python or Bash files that contain the step, imp step implementations. And it then outputs either a PDF in nicely typeset form, that's the one that's going around here, or HTML, or some test code that can be run later. Subplot itself doesn't run the tests. It only generates code. And that domain is where we have our homepage. It's a fancy tech domain, because those are the best domains. It's written in Rust, and it has a, an MIT Zero license, so that it's as easy for other people to use as possible. We do this in our free time with a two-week iteration. So every other Saturday, we have a two to four hour meeting, because meetings are great. Well, our meetings are actually great, and we wish other people would join. And um, it progresses slowly because we are ta uh, taking it taking it through so that we have fun while doing this. If it stops being fun, there's no point in wasting much free time on it. If anyone is interested and wants to help contribute to this, please join the Matrix channel. We would love to help you help us. Questions? Correct. So the question is, how does it work? You write markdown, and then uh, subplot generates uh, Rust code, and that is exactly what happens. And um, let's see. I will do a live demo. Maybe it will work.
This is the beginning of uh, the subplot for a different hobby project of mine. And as you can see, it's just marked down. And eventually we will get to some scenarios. There's one. Given a working oblom system, blah, 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 blah. I will now run this. So in this program, the step functions are written in Python. So uh, subplot produces a Python program, some of which come from a template that con is contained in, in subplot. And uh, some of these come from my, my Obnum file instead. But it's fairly, fairly clear Python, even if I say so myself. And when you run it, everything fails. Log file probably has an error at the end. Sometimes there's an error and then some more text, but... Okay, so the test failed. Sorry, uh, it was running the... Starting the Obnum server, the daemon. And that failed. Oh, I need to compile the program first. This might take a while. Especially since I don't have network on. But it might have everything locally. I haven't taken the laptop out for two years, and I'm not entirely sure how long the battery will last. Okay, it was built. Let's try again. That takes a little longer. It got further before it fell. Oh, uh, it says that the last step that it tried to run is given a manifest of the directory live in initial YAML. That failed. Let's look at the log file again. For some reason, it's failing. This has never happened before during a live demo. <laughs> so I'm not going to try to fix this. I know it worked the last time I tried this on a different computer in a different place. So everything's fine. But this is what uh, using subplot is like. You generate the test. You've realized that you need to build your tests. You build your program. You generate your tests. You run the tests. You figure out what's wrong. This is exactly like all other software development, except a little bit more detached, because you don't edit the actual program. You edit the file from which the program gets generated. But um, the big thing here is that the huge 
64 page paper that's somewhere here um, over there at the moment uh, that's the thing that's actually meant to be understandable to other people so that they know how things are verified and why those verifications are necessary and so far it has worked fine we don't have a huge number of users but i do use this at work in in my work as well and just this weekend the co-worker found a problem using subplot because something changed in the rust clap library so that certain arguments that used to work but got ignored no longer get ignored so now there, there's an error testing is good any other questions neither so the question is does it uh, do unit tests only or also py tests it um, generates an entire python program that doesn't use unit test or doesn't use py test it just has test code but you get to write the test code as you wish we just kept it simple Python, Python 3 to be specific. Uh, that's, also, that's about it. Uh, if your tests use, say, the Python requests library, then you need that as well. But subplot shouldn't add anything else than Python 3. Yeah. And one of the reasons why we generate a program that can be archived is so that Daniel works for a consulting company who has customers who need to, whose products need to be audited by the government. And the auditing basically requires that the test program can be run from five years from now. So uh, having that archived is better than generating on the fly. Because who knows what Python 13 will look like. Or Rust 1.99 or wherever we are at that point. Any other questions? The question is, does it does subplot generate some kind of XML output that can be used in CI? At the moment, no, but we would be happy to consider a patch. <laughs> and I don't joke about that. One of the things that would be really beneficial for us is, us meaning those developing subplot at the moment, is more people who like to use this and have different kinds of requirements than what Daniel and I have. Also, if any of you knows how to use LaTeX to produce beautiful types of output, please contribute. The output that we currently produce is a little basic. It could be improved massively. I think we've run out of questions, so I say thank you. A lovely audience. <laughs>